Welcome to Everyday Economics, a weekly podcast about the economics in daily life. I'm your host, Pooja Mehra. The Indian banking system is in crisis once again. Naturally, many books are being written and published on the subject. In this week's episode, I talk with my senior colleague from the media, Tamal Bandupadhyay, on his new book, Pandemonium, The Great Indian Banking Tragedy. I asked the author why, in his view, Indian corporates rely so much on loans rather than raising equity for doing business. Before I play out the conversation and the answer that he gave to this question for you, let me quote from the foreword written by Dr. Bibek Debroy for this book. That should kindle your interest in it. Dr. Debroy writes, Reams have been written on banking in India, not just research papers, but books too. Since Vaivi Reddy, it has become almost mandatory for ex-RBI governors and a few ex-deputy governors to author books focused on their RBI stints. If you're inside the system, you may know everything about it, but you may have no sense about its place and function in the bigger picture. For years and years, Tamal has been and still is a widely read business journalist across newspapers, especially on banking and finance. Welcome to Everyday Economics, sir. Thank you for making time and many congratulations on your new book, The Great Indian Banking Tragedy, Pandemonium. Thanks. Thanks, Pooja. Thanks to be. <laughs> thanks for calling me. Happy to be here. Uh, this is a very book, big book, you know, that runs into over 450 pages and the graphs 550, and references. 550, yeah, 500, no, 500 the, the, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. The graphs and references are extra and the font is small. So it's actually a very big book packed with so much information, analysis, insights. Uh, reading this book has been such a learning experience for me. Uh, and what, what, you know, what struck me is the detailing in the chapters, especially, uh, you know, like before we started recording, I was speaking to you about the section on Island FS. It yep. is such an exhaustive uh, section that explains, you know, the not only what happened with Island FS, why it uh, collapsed, how it, uh, you know, it, uh, it is being addressed, why it is taking time to find resolution, but also the entire NBFC sector, you know, how it has yeah. evolved, what its problems are. So, it, it, I mean, many, many congratulations and thank you for writing this book. Thank you. Thanks, Pooja. Uh, let me start, uh, you know, chronologically and let me uh, ask you uh, my first question, which is that your book is centered on the question what ails the Indian banking system? Uh, why is it that the Indian banks go into crisis again and again repetitively? Uh, we've, we've, of course, had some very detailed analysis of, uh, you know, why this happens by former RBI governors and their books, etc. But you've been, you know, governors come and go. You've been watching this sector very closely for more than 25 years now. What are the conclusions that you have reached? Uh, why? Why? What is wrong with the Indian banking sec- system? Well, Puja, it's uh, actually this question. Also, the entire book is a quest. Uh, you know, uh, what has gone wrong to understand this? Uh, do I have any definitive answer? I I don't. Uh, which is why I reached out out to past governors and media segments and yes i have been uh, an observer of this sector first as a reporter then as an editor then as a columnist commentator etc etc yes uh, 1995 mid 95 i started covering banks so 25 years now um, uh, so there are many strands uh, but um, to have a sort of reasonably simple answer is this. Um, We have a hugely bank-led financial system. So parallelly, uh, corporate bond market and other uh, sources of funding for Indian corporations and the borrowers um, uh, have not worked out uh, despite our best efforts the way it should have been done. We have abolished the development financial institutions, but our banks have not learned uh, project financing. They are they are pretty good at working capital financing, but even after 20 years, they don't know exactly how to appraise project, how to monitor pro, um, and other stuff. Uh, so and 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 the other bigger issue is um, uh, we have a 
uh, hugely government owned segment in the banks so which is uh, now about 60% plus which is coming down now this large large chunk of um, uh, banking system is government owned and as dr reddy has said it's not uh, the problem not lies in in ownership but the way how the owner behaves uh, unfortunately regulations are not ownership neutral so entire that segment of banking system is it, it it's run very differently you know the obsession for balance sheet growth uh, till recently i have said that it's a, it's it's like a compliant boy syn- syndrome everybody wants to become big there's a hard mentality uh, so ir- irrespective of your size uh, you want to join the bandwagon so if if the country's largest bank state bank of india is having uh, giving an exposure to one entity everybody else is rushes uh, and everybody else goes there and then join the bandwagon even though their size is different risk capital is different uh, so on and so forth uh, so if you ask me this i think that the biggest issue is the uh, the the problems uh, lying uh, lying with the government owned banking system and that leads to the question that should the government be uh, the owner of banks and if they indeed uh, remain uh, how should they behave how would the banking system uh, that particular uh, banking industry uh, no evolved because uh, apart from the balance sheet uh, obsession for balance sheet growth and hard mentality and the uh, and the inability to appreciate risk they are always under pressure uh, to lend under different schemes and to do even things beyond banking you know uh, the aadhar card uh, it's it's at the at the initial stage much later i think a post office um, works in but it, it worked in it it was actually the it was the bank's responsibility to get it registered on a such bharat day you will find the um, public sector bankers um, you know uh, uh, <laughs> cleaning the streets uh, near their branches <laughs> so it's like a tata steel which used to be called tisco they the ad but we also make steel our bankers also do banking so i think i i think that is the larger i'm i'm slight i think probably i'm being unfair to the public sector banks they are it's not that um, they are not efficient they are very passionate about it and there is no incentive to work but still uh, they they work so hard but um, when you are under this kind of and they will never admit it they will always smile they said that uh, somebody in fact said that we are the warriors nothing to do with reference to covid generally they said we are the we are they, they just like work like uh, military on the front you know you have been dedicated uh, you have been asked to do something they have the commitment they would uh, they would work so it's a very complex problem we need to figure out how to what is the i mean there are many strands of the problem but i think to a large extent it is the ownership of the government for a large part of the banking segment that's that's therein lies the problem Uh, so what i make out from what you're saying which in fact uh, uh, echoes what uh, uh, you know other analysts have been saying uh, it is that uh, banks have been playing the role of the, uh, uh, a role other than what banking involves partly because they are owned by government and government presses in banks when it needs to uh, meet certain social and economic goals so for instance uh, when they are not able to give a fiscal stimulus they ask banks to give loans uh, when they want uh, uh, aadhar card or financial inclusion or uh, swachh bharat kind of small goals uh small from the point of view of uh, 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 what banks need should be involved with it should at best be csr but it probably tends to get more than that for them because their promoter and owners uh, sorry their owners are, are is government but also you said that uh, all all these uh, financial institutions 
uh, that are supposed to do long term lending have not really worked in india and therefore banks step into that role but they don't have the wherewithal or the expertise to play that role is that right that's what you're Abs- saying absolutely absolutely so banking uh, is our our public sector banking system is a political animal okay or socio political angle so they are being repeatedly used by you no know, it it really doesn't matter who is in the government which party it's irrespective everybody does it yeah it started with bank nationalization which again was a political move uh, absolutely at that point of time uh, so right from bank nationalization till today uh, it has been a it has been an instrument it's a political instrument used by the ruling party you you spoke about financial inclusion and pmjdy look at the percentage of share the private banks have in that in that you no know, then the it, it it will be i think probably uh, there's certainly less than 10% uh, so entire but, but, on this, yeah I'm yeah but i want to bring opening. yeah I, at this point i want to bring data you know which i had an inkling of this i've been talking about this but the data the way you put it has just opened my eyes this is on page number 121 where you talk about how uh, you know uh, you you've just said that uh, public sector banks do a lot more of this uh, jandhan accounts and financial inclusion and private sector banks probably do less than 10% but look at the new business in loans and deposits the share of public sector banks in new loans has dropped from 73% in 2014 to just 24% in 2019 yes. and the erosion in new deposits is even sharper from yes. 76.42% to 20.48% between just 2014 and 2019 in in yes. in such a short span on time uh so the real business that makes profits what is banking <laughs> banking is to raise deposits and lend money uh the real profit making business of banking has passed on to private sector banks absolutely absolutely and in fact um, you I, i'm very impressed the way you read you are you are pretty meticulous you are even marking the page number but you see there is one segment in the book which is only the segment of charts 16 pages of yes. charts and there i explained now you call it privatization by stealth you call it backdoor privatization but which is shown how public sector bank is losing their market share now why why that's the question now if you see the over the past few years uh, a there's a, there 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 is a risk aversion uh, by them because uh, they don't want to they don't want to give loans and and the loans turn bad and they watch it that's point number 1 point number 2 is there's a fear psychosis because some of the loans have gone bad but our investigative agencies smell rat everywhere no they don't they don't distinguish between commercial decision going wrong and and actual wrong doing uh, and then there are also uh, reserve bank of india put 11 odd banks out of which 10 were sector under pca so yeah. they were constrained from lending so combination of that actually has opened up the ground for private sector they are they are lapping it up and that's that's on that's on the asset side meaning the giving loans but even for deposits you and me always we perceive that the mass this feel that the you know they are very very comfortable with public sector banks because they are the proxy sovereign and they represent government of india but no even on the de- deposit side they are losing uh, losing market share dramatically the every incremental deposit you see how the uh, private sector bank are grabbing that because of the better technology uh, they want to reach out to the to the younger clientele so on and so forth so it's a whether i mean the government can continue to remain the owner of that particular segment uh, because consolidation brings down the number of bank but not the but not the actual proportion of their size but the backdoor privatization or privatization by stealth uh, has already started absolutely the government can own banks but the banking business is moved in, moving into uh, private yes. Uh, yes. private banks and yes. uh, Uh, i i i don't know how sustainable this is going to be because if profits are going to move and profitable business is going to move then the government can only is only going to have to keep recapitalizing uh, for it. for losses and That's... i don't know how sustainable that is yeah
yeah that that that's that's what is happening which is why i think the uh, the latest round of talks about privatization which we don't know to what extent government is serious about it if privatization meaning say, lic picking up majority stake in idbi banks like so that's idbi a mock- <laughs> that's a mockery I, of privatization it, but it, the fact, government is serious we need to see yeah and in fact i, I the... noted you put quotation marks around uh, lic trying to privatize idbi bank yeah uh, but the inter- interesting part is the new as we speak which has nothing to do with the book the the latest uh, reserve bank of india working group uh, suggestions uh, or yes, recommendations i wanted to bring that up corporations will be allowed to get into banking so if we if you see the two and two together that government willing to uh, seat control and privatize and uh, corporations being allowed if there's a pattern in it i do not know or you need to wait and watch uh, are you saying that government has no option left no other option is this uh, you allow them to uh, you allow them to do the way they should do business not use as a political instrument uh, because you know you can't expect you look at the way uh, their salary structure uh, look at yeah. the way you see the pub, uh, state bank of india is uh, roughly 22% of the indian banking system and you compare with state bank of india salary with with uh, with any private sector bank uh, not even large even relatively smaller private sector banks you will see that now yes state bank of india chairman uh, lives in a big bungalow but you can't eat uh, <laughs> you know that bungalow yeah. so so where where what is the incentive to be efficient in uh, barring passion Uh, for being uh, in in the government job and you know creating nations so the the bulk of them actually live in nostalgia that we build you abuse us you say we are inefficient but we we have built bridges we have created new india we have created roads had we not been there there would not be any infrastructure and all so they live in nostalgia and they they give their they give everything the passion the commitment uh, but ultimately uh, it uh, what do you the banking system where does it uh, where does it go exactly so you, to figure and, out, you know and their 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 their, their wages and salary etc is constrained by um, the bureaucrats the ias wage structure and um, so why what is the why should it be linked with that there why should no the reason. bank ceos Uh, salary why can't he get a bigger salary more than, than the you know, banking that? secretary yeah 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 why so should he yeah. is a parallel parallel um, you know manager for the banking system reserve bank of india is a regulator but then it comes mm-hmm. to department manager come so owner person. no uh, the yes. department functions like like the owner like yes uh, it's a it's so so they will they are Uh, they will continue irrespective of the which government is in power they all behave uh, the same dfs considers banking uh, system is a department of government yes yes let's make it very clear yes and um, uh, former governor raghuram rajan and deputy governor viril acharya have just uh, in fact yesterday put out a, a you know their objection to this new proposal of uh, um, Uh, the working group in the rbi uh, which makes uh, which says that uh, uh, diversified business groups could be allowed to uh, own banks in india yeah. uh, uh, and you're say you so you're saying that you you are with them on this that you know this is not a good idea and it makes sense uh, you know as it is we have so much problem of the banker promoter nexus uh, which uh, we have seen play out in the last 7 8 years but uh, but the point remains that uh, you know if there was going to be privatization of banks then uh, if not the deep pocket indian business houses who else uh, is going to have the money to buy these banks so which means that you know uh, they cannot the ownership cannot change hands because the only people who are going to have money to buy banks are these people you know there is there um, you know there is not either uh, either or it's not that um, yes uh, i am hugely against it but the point is if you see there are there are two caveats done that corporate uh, large corporate houses will be allowed provided reserve bank the banking regulation act gets amended, amended rbi yeah. yeah rbi has power to look at all the connected lending etc so right now under one section of banking regulation act only the common directors you know if the director is common then uh, they are the company or uh, uh, where their director those companies cannot get uh, cannot get cannot borrow from the banks so that's that's a very limited thing 
now they want to expand it he said any any which way no connected lending i agree you can you can you can uh, amend the act and and um, and create that scope for reserve bank of india but the second caveat is this is said that you need to strengthen rbi supervision now who will give the who will give the certificate that rbi is qualified enough because the way we have seen unfortunately in the past few years everywhere whether it's a non banking financial turf whether it is a, a banking turf or whether it is cooperative banking stuff reserve bank of india supervisory role has not you know come out with flying colors there are problems everywhere and now so and um, as you are aware reserve bank of india wanted to create a special supervisory cadre yes. which they they had some the, kind of opposition within the employee, employee employees yeah. are opposing and, and, it yes and it has not been happened so when will when would we say that reserve bank of india has has acquired the power to supervise yeah this so, is a sequencing issue first so, the regulation has to be in place the supervisory cadre has to be absolutely competent and on top of their job yeah. and then you think about uh, you know these new ownership rules isn't it yeah. so how can that, you first come up with new ownership rules and then begin to so plan about be, regulation no, now now see if you are if you if you have decided to allow them then i'm sure overnight um, or very quickly the law can be amended and reserve bank of india can claim that yes we have we are now competent to supervise <laughs> so we need to watch but uh, to answer your question that then who will if we don't allow the big pocket um, the big pocket uh, corporations then who will run the bank who have the ability to manage it now you will find that the, how the over leverage most of the indian companies and those who are not over leverage or uh, then uh, you have to see also how well governed they are so then where do we get i think there could be no uh, there could be i'm sure there will be fit and proper uh, indian private entities and foreign institutions including private equity guys to invest because you are now saying that up to 26% why not you get a, a club of institutions uh, up to 26% each one or two or three of them uh, and then uh, you work out some pattern or you could be uh, you know on the line of national investment and infrastructure fund niif niif mm -hmm. you create a banking investment fund you know, which mm -hmm. can invest up to 26% in the bank so uh, niif is an investment platform uh, which is which has brought government of india and international investors looking for opportunities in inf infrastructure so similarly you work on a banking investment fund you call it bif for something and let them let the government be a party uh, you know also a partner and uh, let them figure out some of the some of the uh, weak psu banks i am sure they they offer a fantastic franchise at least the liability franchise there'll be enough takers of that so you not necessarily go for large corporates for deep pockets there are ways uh, to figure out how you sort this out provided you have the political will to do this and we've already seen this happen in and you documented so well in the nbfc space where they're raising uh, you know they they they're raising loans from a company and then they uh, you know so much of uh, bungling is going on they just end up replicating all of that in the banking sector absolutely absolutely i mean there are names of the companies how they have actually misused uh, yes. and uh, under the nose of reserve bank of india uh, so so um, you know i think rbi is a is a pretty respected regulator it has been uh, it has been doing pretty well uh, uh, when it comes to particularly the covid time it has it has done a, uh, the new governor has has done a phenomenal job i would say till now but um, when it comes to supervision and regulations uh, beginning 2008 2009 Uh, this uh, last couple of years even as we speak you will find the um, it's it has not come out with the flying colors so mm, yeah. there is problem there is ilfs there is dfhl there is pmc there is s yes bank there is lvv uh, <laughs> so there are so it's it's um, now you think that this uh, regulator um, you know will overnight acquire these uh, it, it has to be smarter than the large corporation yeah it has yeah. to be smarter yeah. than the large corporation yeah. so who will give the certificate that yes our reserve bank of india has become very smart 
they will really they can smell the rat in advance and all and one of the reasons which you discussed also in the book you know the supervisory the supervision mechanism which has changed from camels rate from camel c a m e l s it has gone to risk based supervision and that risk based supervision doesn't care much for transaction testing um and uh, one of the reasons for the pnb crisis particularly is this lack of transaction testing so rbi also needs to go back to the drawing board and and you know to figure out and must figure out and does some soul searching what are the things lacking in the entire system of of supervision and and regulations um they need to they need to they need to look at those i mean you can have rules and regulations but uh, when it comes to implementation as i said uh, from camels based supervision to risk based supervision yes it's modern it it looks at risk at the macro level but then if you don't do transaction testing then this uh, little uh, bank branch near rbi is under uh, literally RBI fraud is yeah. yeah fraud is going uh, to go undetected punjab national bank uh, branch at the honiman circle in india which is 100 years away from reserve bank of india central office <laughs> that was the that was the epic center of this yeah to be yeah. plus yeah. fraud yeah 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 and it was such a simple uh, way of uh, conducting fraud and um, uh, they just created a firewall and they created two separate sets of books yes uh, one for showing to rbi inspections and one the real uh, you know where all, all the tra- dubious transactions were being recorded it was just such a simple way of doing fraud yeah yeah uh you make a very insightful uh, point in the book uh, which i think takes us to the crux of the problem uh, which is that you know when business is done in india it is done mainly with capital raised as loans rather than equity i think that that sort of pretty much tells us why things go wrong again and again in the banking sector um uh, why there is the uh, banker uh, politician bureaucrat uh, business owner nexus yes. uh, um you know if you could narrate since you know your book is about you know it tells the story of the tragedy of indian banking uh, you know you you take it you tell the story not just the image of story but how it has evolved you know so if you could if you could just you know uh, tell my listeners how has business evolved in this way and has banking responded to business evolving in this way or has business responded to banking evolving in this way uh, well it's a little um, there's no straight answer it's a very complex thing but as yeah. as you said actually this is not i am uh, my discovery as such it's it's i think dr raghuram rajan is one person uh, before taking the plunge and taking the system head on Uh, through his uh, aqr asset quality review um, reserve bank of india under his stewardship and i think mr mundra was the deputy governor at that point of time uh, first they did this click data um, where essentially the the reasonably large account um, they need they wanted to have a real time information uh, that's how they started in 2014 and they then they found that the discrepancies this one particular account is is good in one bank on one bank's book or bad on another bank's book now how is that possible and that led to the discovery that you know large part of indian uh, corporations uh, the companies you know our corporate world actually you know they they don't bring money on the table their own money equity it's essentially they use bank money both for equity and for debt um so that's that's the bank now how why are they encouraged to do this and how could they get away doing this there are two three things uh, uh the other pa- other side of the story is the public sector banks obsession for growth if you look at the 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 efficient banks you know like say uh, at this point of time if you are an investors i think the two banks you will pick up one is hdfc bank and other is uh, kotak bank now you look at them they are exposed to large corporations or infrastructures etc purely virtually nil because they are risk averse or rather they understand how to manage risk mitigate risk, and uh, and uh, then there are no compulsion for them to take exposures into those segments so if you leave that out um, so it's a largely largely the public sector banks um, onus is 
basically whether it's infrastructure or or you know they they kept on changing the they kept on changing the the segment it's uh, today it's steel tomorrow it's telecom the day before yesterday it was uh, infrastructure and everywhere they burn their fingers and now we we have we are coming to a situation where it's only the government who can who, who can borrow and the banks can give money to them because there is no sector is left everywhere they have exposure and they they found that um, things are turning bad uh, so that we were we were coming to that situation that's the ultimate you no know, government is the um, government government is the borrower government of last resort the, yeah yeah government will be the it's it's uh, so that is why i also raised the question that uh, are we actually going the japan way so that was the kind of situation you have the so called crony capitalists taking advantage of the banking system and if if you have a large part of the banking system which not which is not so efficient in terms of uh, uh, you know um, uh, appreciation of of risk and managing risk but they are always under pressure uh, to build their balance sheet and there's a hard mentality because this we have a consortium lending so bank a goes and bank b c d also will be going and also in my book you will find there's a role played by sbi capital markets yes so uh, you know it is there is a clear conflict of interest sbi capital market is owned by the country's largest lender and it's 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 appraising the projects and it's also selling the projects so loan syndications so when when sbi walks in then sbi capital markets flaunting the sbi card draws others used to draw other other banks as well uh, now a bank like dena or bank of maharashtra or uco or andhra bank they are their size their risk appetite everything is completely different but because sbi is there and the project is appraised by sbi man sbi caps and project the loan syndication I mean managed by sbi caps so all these guys get in and at the end of the day when the particular loan goes bad sbi probably have not probably has much larger balance sheet strength to absorb that but the other banks evergreening not. happens uh, then you keep on doing then you keep on finding yeah. ways because you know it's not that you are helping the corporations to uh, this way you are helping you're yourself. yourself yeah helping yeah. yourself because nobody wants to no, nobody wants to uh, leave in a bad note again the root of the problem is this if you look at the way aditya puri was there for 26 years uh, till it turned yeah. 70 but public sector banks uh, tenure till recently it could have been one year or two year now it's roughly about three years at least for state bank of india so then why do you care about you know the first year goes uh, uh, to telling the world that uh, your predecessor was not good you actually <laughs> you actually cleaned up the system so your uh, you inspired the confidence of the uh, of the investors and then the next year or the third year you leave on the same note Uh, by by evergreening and showing the balance sheet good uh, because who wants and in to... the last 6 months you be, begin to lobby to become the next rbi <laughs> governor <laughs> <laughs> no that's yeah or so I, i'm only I, joking <laughs> yeah so so it, this is the kind of so this is the kind of situation in fact talking about the public sector bank you, you'll see there's a there's a chart there who have discussed that how much it takes to identify a successor and yes. there Uh, in case of andhra bank it was 264 days imagine two in fact they keep they keep positions vacant for so long they keep positions on board days, nine months that top position was vacant that was one vacant. extreme and and for bank of baroda which is the first experiment of bank consolidation in india when jay kumar left his successor from sbi sanjeev chadda came and the gap between the two uh jay kumar leaving and sanjeev the walking in was 100 days and you call it this is the biggest experiment in indian public sector banking <laughs> consolidation 100 days three and a half months that position was vacant so this this is this is very deep malaise yeah. and very complex there are many contributing factors but definitely one of the contributing large contributing factors is the government ownership and not the ownership per se but how the government behaves it's a political yeah. instrument and this yeah. has nothing to do with the with the color of the government every All government every yes. sector right it's not it's not government. ideological it's not yes. ideological no, at all no 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 it's, it's political it's a, pragmatism it's a political instrument it's a political instrument uh, being used from has been in use since uh, bank nationalization 50 years plus 
uh, you know, you uh, uh, you have documented case studies of almost all the frauds that we have that have come to light, uh, uh, for frauds and cases of bank failure the, uh, that have come to light in the last few years. But yep. I was hoping, you know, to ask you to uh, uh, talk about any one of them. I would put personally like you to talk about Yes Bank because we've talked so so much about public sector banks. So just to sort of, you know, bring out that, uh, you know, how, how much in depth you have also talked about private banks. Uh, so I would like you to talk about Yes Bank, but if you, if there's some other case study you'd like to talk about that you have. No, Yes Bank, your... I think I think Yes Bank is an interesting case because yes, you know, yes Bank was, it, it's again, it's a multi-dimension, but roughly speaking, I think Mr. Rana Kapoor was, was following some a model which is something unique, which is never uh, tried in India. It's a junk bond, junk bond hmm. model. We hmm. don't have any junk bond market. Now overseas, you have a, you you pay. It's a high risk, high, high return business. There's a junk bond, the junk papers. You you subscribe to the papers. You earn higher interest rates, and then uh, you may not get even your principal back. So that's that's it. Now in the in the loan market, he was creating the junk loan market which essentially uh, those borrowers which will not get money from anybody else can come could come to yes bank and get money of course at a price so then you pay higher price and also then he was also cutting into two at the one end it's the it's the price the the low the interest you pay and second is the very high fees that you pay. Now, this combination of very high P and high interest rate actually would make sure that, suppose it's a five-year loan given. Uh, I'm talking about not working capital loans. I'm talking project financing. It's a five-year loan. So by year three, uh, the combination of high interest rate and very high fees, you have been able to manage 50, 60, 70% of the money already you you got, you, you pocketed. I'm taking the bank. And then if if you find that the the um, corporate that particular entity is in trouble, uh, where in invariably it will be in trouble, uh, then you settle for it. And then even if you have a haircut, but still you are in banking parlance in the money because you have already recovered 60, 70 percent uh, through high interest rates and very high, uh, very high um, uh, fees. So that was the model he was working on. But then then the other dimension started. You know, as he grew, I think, confident about his ability to run this model, A, on the one hand, we found that uh, the, the companies, the borrowers are turning defaulters, but Yes Bank was finding ways to park those assets with somebody else and bring them back later. So whenever RBI said that, look, this is a bad asset, RBI, he, he, this gentleman would, would say, yes, this is bad asset, but we will make sure that is not in my books, on my books anymore. And lo and behold, you would make sure that uh, this, this asset is being sold to somebody else. So there was a coterie or the system or uh, with some of the other banks and, and NBFCs, it, it, he has created a sort of relationship where you 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 park those assets uh, uh, away from the glare of Reserve Bank of India and bring that back at a different point. So that was one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is this the the allegedly his his compromise approach. Uh, he was more looking after his family offices and others. So all these combinations, um, you know, led to this problem, and which has been graphically described. And I yeah, think, uh, I think there was uh, a whistleblower. Or... Yes, yes. So there was actually this. This refers to a particular property in Delhi, in a in a very posh Tony Ma, Tony uh, Delhi locality, uh, where an entity it's it's there in the book was given a loan, and that particular entity turned a defaulter, and then the property was seized and sold. Uh, to Rana Kapoor's family. And that that was actually a letter went to Reserve Bank of India at that point of time. It was the previous governor's Dr. Ujit Patel stable. And then the RBI got into action uh, and then the RBI found all these issues one after another. So there's no choice but um, but to but um, but, Rana, but to ask Rana Kapoor to go. And so, as I have said, uh, Rana Kapoor, actually the Yes Bank, he turned into um, um, a My Bank at the first stage. And when I say My Bank, I'm not saying it figuratively. Actually, My Bank is one of the names of the five or six names that have been considered while the bank was conceptualized and they're looking for the name. And 
at at the second layer. So first first stage he became he made it my bank, and then of course he he turned out to be no bank for himself. Uh, <laughs> so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a graphically how you destroy an institution. Uh, through misgovernance, how you make your board eating out of your hands, um, how you make uh, some of your key people work for your family offices, even though they are on the payroll of the bank. Uh, so it's a combination of, um, you know, it, it started all well, a new model. I had no problem if you create a junk loan market. But then I think greed overtook. And that's how that's that's the that's the sad part of it it's especially sad uh, for yes bank because you know it was it was supposed to be a new generation i mean you know post liberalization uh, i mean a poster boy for uh, everything new uh, yes. but sadly uh, you know it has like you call it uh, call the the section fallen a- fallen angels uh, did not cover itself in uh, glory on on that note uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for taking out time uh, to speak to me. Uh, this is such an interesting book with the kind of details, uh, honestly, that, uh, you know, is a reporter's delight, a journalist's delight to see them. Um, uh, thank you so much for writing this book and coming to my podcast. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Pooja.